Hello, this is the online version of the message for uh, the Lord's Day, August 1st, 2021. And I'll start by reading scripture. A reading from 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. Hear what the Spirit is saying to the church. And then it's in the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent Joab with his officers and all Israel with him. They ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabbah. But David remained at Jerusalem. It happened late one afternoon when J David rose from his couch and was walking about on the roof of the king's house that he saw from the roof a woman bathing. She was very beautiful. David sent someone to inquire about the woman. It was reported, this is Bathsheba, daughter of Eliam, and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. So David sent messengers to get her, and she came to him, and he lay with her. Now she was purifying herself after her period. Then she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, I am pregnant. So David sent word to Joab, send me Uriah the Hittite. And Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked how Joab and the people fared and how the war was going. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah went out of the king's house and there followed him a present from the king. But Uriah slept at the entrance of the king's house with all of his servants, of servants to his Lord and did not go down to his house. When they told David, Uriah did not go down to his house, David said to Uriah, you have just come from a journey. Why don't you go down to your house? And Uriah said, the ark and Israel and Judah remain in booths. And my Lord Joab and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house to eat and drink and to lie with my wife? As you live, and as your soul lives, I will not do such a thing. Then David said to Uriah, remain here today also, and tomorrow I will send you back. So Uriah remained in Jerusalem that day. On the next day, David invited him to eat and drink in his presence and made him drunk. And in the evening, he went out to lie on his couch and the servants of his Lord, but he did not go down to his house. In the morning, David sent, wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by hand of Uriah. In the letter he wrote, send Uriah to the forefront of the hardest fighting and then draw back from him so that he may be struck down and die. So the messenger went and came and told David all that Joab had sent him to tell. And the messenger sent, said to David, the men gained an advantage over us and came out against us in the field, but we drove them back to the entrance of the gate. Then the archers shot at your servants from the wall. Some of the king's servants are dead and your, your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. David said to the messenger, thus you shall say to Joab, do not let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. Pass your attack, press your attack on the city and overthrow it and encourage him. When the, when the wife of Uriah heard that her husband was dead, she made lamentation for him. When the morning was over, David sent and brought her to his house and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased the Lord, and the Lord sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said, there were two men in a certain city, the rich, one rich, the other poor. The rich man had many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing but one little ewe lamb which he had brought. He brought it up, and it grew up with him 
and his children. And he used to eat of his meager fare and drink from his cup and lie in his bosom. The lamb was like a daughter to him. Now there came a traveler to the rich man, and he was loath to take one of his own flock or herd to prepare for the wayfarer who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared that for the guest who had come to him. When David heard this, his anger was greatly kindled against the man. He said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man who has done this deserves to die. And he shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing, because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, you are the man. Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I anointed you king over Israel. I rescued you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house, your master's wives into your bosom. I gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if you had been, and if that had been too little, I would have added as much more. Why have you despised the word of the Lord to do what is evil in his sight? You have struck down Uriah the Hittite with the sword, and you have taken his wife to be your wife. You have killed him with the sword of the Ammonites. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart your house, for you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, I will raise up trouble against you with, from within your house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and will give them to your neighbor, and he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the very sun. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Do you like reading novels? Are there any movie buffs among you? What about all that incredible TV that's on nowadays, especially on the streaming services? As I get to know you better, I predict I will hear about your favorites. Some of you are probably Star Trek fans. Some of you love The Simpsons. Maybe old movies like Cary Grant movies. I love those. What about Julia Roberts? Or how about musicians like J-Lo or Beyonce? This is one of the ways in which we get to know each other. It's through culture and stories that we are invited to enter the minds of other people. There are studies that show that reading fiction makes you a more empathetic person. In fact, it might make you a better person, even though you think it's just entertainment. It was through the novels of the 19th century that the public became concerned about social justice. Harriet Beecher Stowe's uh, novel, Uncle Tom's Cabin, energized ordinary white people to support the abolition movement against slavery. Dickens' novels, they were serialized in newspapers and the people uh, waited week to week to see them and read them. And those stories uh, helped cause wealthy people to care about the living and working conditions of the poor in England of the time. By appealing to people's emotions, you can motivate them to act. Now we all love a cracking good story, especially when it has some sex and violence and maybe a little betrayal in it. And that brings us to David, David and Bathsheba. It has all the ingredients of a great page turner. Now, David was going to be a different kind of king. He was a man after God's own heart. He was humble. He was the boy that slayed the, the great giant Goliath with just a simple sling and no armor. 
he was the one that patiently waited in the ravines around Jerusalem while Saul was pursuing him. He was embarrassed to live in a house of cedar while the Lord lived in a tent. But alas, he ended up being just like those other kings, and he abused the gifts that God had given him. Now, the story opens with David staying behind in Jerusalem. Instead of accompanying the army during the spring marching season, like he ordinarily did, and choosing to hang around his palace and walking on his roof, you could see David's imagination was running wild when he sees Bathsheba bathing. And of course, he summons her. He was probably thinking, well, I'm the king. It's my right, isn't it? Are you hooked to the story yet? Well, he gets her pregnant and he wants to cover up his tracks. And when Bathsheba's husband Uriah refuses to play the part in David's scheme, David does the most despicable thing possible. He uses his power as king in order that Uriah might be killed in battle. When this happens, even some of David's own innocent men get killed in, in implementing the plot. And David cavalierly says, oh, don't let this matter trouble you, for the sword devours now one and now another. What the heck happened to this guy? What happened to David? Now, I chose to combine last week's reading about David and Bathsheba with this week's reading about the rebuke from Nathan for a reason. Because when you look at them together, you can see a bit more about what David was thinking by looking at the whole story and also realizing that we're talking about ancient Middle Eastern people here. It's important for us to not project too much of our own views on this. But looking at that, you can see why David was thinking what he was thinking and why he became so upset about it. Now, Nathan's parable about the rich and the poor man, and then David's strong reaction to the story reveals David's shame. David's casual abuse of power and the callousness of letting people die to cover up his adultery was such a giant departure from his character. David hid his deeds because he was ashamed. And David's shame is our shame but maybe not in the way you think. This story is often misused by pastors and preachers, and I'll explain that a little bit later. It's only my second week in the pulpit with you, and I'm going to go there and I'm going to talk about shame because it's vitally important, and this story tells it so well. Carol McLaughlin, who is the pastor over at the Quilcene Church over uh, near Port Townsend across the Sound from where we are, um, and she's also part of the Northwest Coast Presbytery, but she's also my professor. I took a couple of counseling classes from her, and I also took a, a, a class called Shame, Grace, and Resilience, and she said something really interesting to me. She said, I really wish we would talk about shame in the prayer of confession instead of our guilt. Because guilt doesn't eat away at you and doesn't cause you to hide. No, it's shame that does that. And God's grace and forgiveness in Jesus can alleviate our shame. If any of you are familiar with Brene Brown or a Brene Brown fan, this sounds really familiar. But even if you're not, I think that this story can really help. You know, David was a king. Now, in the, middle, in the Near East, the ancient Near East, 
a king was probably more like a warlord or a tribal leader uh, instead of what we think of as a king. And it was routine in those times for kings to add to their harem. It would have been common for David to simply offer Uriah compensation for, <clears throat> for taking Bathsheba rather than trying to hide it. Hittite or uh, Uriah being a Hittite mercenary would have been very familiar with this. So why did David go to such lengths to conceal his adultery and then eliminate Uriah when he didn't want to comply? And Uriah was uh, not complying for all the right reasons. He was being faithful to his job and his mission. Well, there's more to this story than meets the eye because David may have felt some sexual shame. I mean, he took Bathsheba and she probably most likely had no choice in the matter. But Nathan's parable shows that that probably or wasn't all, it certainly wasn't all of it and may not have figured into David's shame. It was more dereliction of duty. It was injustice that Nathan points out. And in this parable, the poor man's sheep was everything to him. He even says that the, the, his sheep, his sheep was like a daughter. The lamb was like a daughter to him. And when the powerful rich man acted with impunity, that gross unfairness, especially of the rich man's callousness toward the, toward the poor man, infuriated David. Yet, David showed his impunity, just like the rich man, and how he treated his troops, how he treated Bathsheba, how he treated Uriah, whose honor was intact, how he treated Nathan, David, this lowly shepherd, the patient one that we learn or that we've been following for a few weeks, showed no empathy and no caring. His power as king had gone to his head. He did not just sin, he became corrupted and unjust. This is how, as I was mentioning, the story is misused often. Many preachers focus only on the sexual sin and only on the adultery, and they ignore David's injustice and irresponsibility. Now, it's common practice in our culture to focus on personal sin, on individualism, and to see the bad outcomes just as God's punishment of us. And we ignore corruption and impunity and the abuse of power. Even worse, we'll say, some of these preachers will say, you know, David was an imperfect ruler and God used him anyway. That's a very common theme in telling of this story. They will say, oh, God uses imperfect leaders all the time as an excuse for turning a blind eye to corruption and abuse of power. And then we become numb. And we say things like, well, you know, we're all sinners. We excuse bad behavior or even dangerous behavior doing this. This is shame at work. It's not facing the truth. It's hiding from the truth. David's shame came to, from his arrogance and his lack of trust in God. From this point forward, David's reign was beset with strife and divisions. Some see it as a punishment from God, but it's also just a natural consequence of his distrust. His shame came came in that he knew that if the people saw how cowardly he acted and what a scoundrel he was, that he would lose their trust. And he did. And that's the way shame works. We don't hide guilt, not usually, but we always hide shame. <clears throat> 
because it's too painful and it shows the world what we fear most about ourselves. How often do we say to ourselves, if only people knew how terrible I really am. Nathan confirmed David's worst fears when he quotes the Lord by saying, for you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the sun. At this point, you might be saying, gee, Pastor Rob, why are you being such a downer? <laughs> well, I have news for you. Here where, here's where Paul comes in to the rescue in uh, Ephesians. Now, this is really kind of funny. I find, I find it hilarious, actually, because Paul usually doesn't come to the rescue when it, co when it comes to matters of shame. <laughs> um, but he says, but each of us was given grace according to the measure of Christ's gift. Therefore, it is said, when he ascended on high, he made captivity itself a captive. He gave gifts to his people. It is in grace where we feel safe enough to face our shame. Instead of hiding it, Jesus' captivity, it makes captivity itself a captive. Now, isn't that liberating? No matter who we are, no matter what we've done, no matter where we're going, no matter what, we don't have to feel ashamed and we don't have to hide anymore because we're saved by Christ. One of the most important things I learned from Pastor Carol is that storytelling is simply too important to ignore. In our stories, we can connect and feel empathy for one another. If we make everything about personal sin only, we're blind to the gift of grace and the acceptance that that grace offers. Stories teach us empathy. They help us discern what's right and what's wrong. And if we listen carefully, we can keep from being distracted and we can, we can keep from being distracted from those who abuse power and who are willing to destroy to destroy in order to hide their shame. David's shame is our shame. When we recognize that and we work through it and we live it out in our lives, we become a healthier people in a healthier community and we become one in the body of Christ. And this is our story. Let us pray. Merciful and gracious God, your gift of grace is limitless and unending if we only accept it, not just in some theoretical way or just some far off salvation, but you offer it to us here today in the way that you save us from our own shame. Create wide margins of grace so that we can be sisters and brothers in you. I pray this in Jesus' holy name. Amen.